The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good morning and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to the latest installment of the HDSA Research Webinar Series. Um, today I'm very excited to have uh, a speaker coming to us all the way from Sweden. So we'll see how this, uh, this goes, Dr. Kristina Bachanovich. Um, who is a researcher at the Karolinska Institute in Stockholm, Sweden. Uh, but before I introduce uh, Christina and what she'll be presenting, I just wanted to uh, remind everyone if they're new to the research webinar or go to webinar, um, how you can ask questions. Uh, you can go to the menu on the right hand side of your screen in the, in the section that says questions, which I've highlighted here in red. You can type your question uh, that you'd want to ask uh, Christina at any time during her presentation and at the end we'll go through and try to answer as many of them as possible. Uh, we are recording this uh, so don't feel bad if you have to drop out or you have you know family members or, or uh, other f people in your community that you think would benefit from seeing this webinar you can access this through hdsa.org or go by looking at our YouTube channel um, and within the next week it should be posted there. So our first, our speaker today is, as I mentioned, is Kristina Bachanovich. Um, this is a, a press release. You may have, if you've been following, you get Google alerts or HD uh, news alerts on your phone or email. Uh, you may have seen this story uh, where Kristina uh, recently published a paper this past May uh, in a very prestigious journal, Nature of Neuroscience, where they've identified a variant in, a gene, in the gene variant uh, that plays a role in determining either early or late onset of Huntington's disease. Um, this is just a press release taken from Science Daily. Um, and today we've invited Christina to talk a little bit about um, what her data showed and uh, what a, get everyone un understanding what SNPs are. Uh, uh, and she'll define that in just a moment. Um, so, Dr. Bakanovich is, as I mentioned, coming to us from um, Stockholm, Sweden, where uh, she is originally from, and she did an undergraduate degree at the University of Stockholm in molecular biology. Uh, she followed with a PhD in experimental medicine at the Karolinska Institute in Stockholm, uh, and then moved to Vancouver, Canada in 2005, where she worked as a postdoctoral fellow um, before moving up, moving up the ranks and promoting to, being promoted to a research associate um, where she spent a total of seven years at uh, University of British Columbia working in the laboratory of uh, Dr. Blair Levitt. Um, as I mentioned, she's currently a researcher at the Karolinska Hospital in Stockholm where she's continuing her work uh, in understanding neurologic diseases, both Huntington's disease and Parkinson's disease. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Christina. So thank you, George, and thanks everyone for joining us today. Uh, let's see. Share your screen. Yeah. Let's see. Can you see the screen now? Yes. So thanks everyone for joining us today. It is a privilege for me to be able to share some of my uh, research with you. Uh, and the title of my talk is Genetic Variation in Huntington Promoter as a Bidirectional Modifier of Huntington's Disease. So I actually want to talk about disease modifiers today, and I will try to explain to you what a genetic modifier is. So given this very complex title, um, <laughs> I first want to guide you through some of the concepts that are important for understanding the results from the study I will present to you today. So. First of all, I want to give you a background. I want to, uh, to introduce you to uh, a few different concepts in biology. And these are uh, concepts such as chromosomes, genetic variants, SNPs, promoter, genetic modifier, and allelic imbalance. So let's first uh, look at this uh, first image is showing all pairs of chromosomes. So each person has 23 pairs of chromosomes, half from the father and half from the mother. And when using this one specific dye, we will all show the same colors for the different uh, chromosomes, and you can all pair them up nicely like this. 
So there are approximately 20,000 genes packaged onto these chromosomes. So each gene occupies a particular location on a specific chromosome, and the Huntington gene is located on the short arm of chromosome 4. So the genes contain the code of instructions, which determines each individual's development, growth, and function. And then you have the DNA, which makes up the genes. They are the basic units of heredity. So if you look at this next image, we have the chromosome on the left-hand side panel, and then we have the Huntington gene. The Huntington gene has a sequence of three DNA bases that are coded with C, A, G. Those are the letters coding for uh, these, um, uh, well, specific DNA bases. And the CG repeat is uh, repeated multiple times. So this region is called a tree nucleotide repeat. So Huntington gene carriers have a Huntington gene cont uh, containing too many copies of the CG repeat. Let's try to see if I can see. Yeah, now I see my pointer there. So in Huntington's disease, uh, HD gene carriers, they have an increased CG repeat length. Normally, um, you have maybe between an average is between 16 to 20 CG repeats. And in an aged patient, you would have 36 repeats or more. And lengths of 40 or more are considered fully penetrant. So Huntington, uh, the protein, is very important for development. And it will keep the uh, neurons healthy and happy. While the mutated Huntington protein is a little bit too long, a little bit too bulky, and it will actually disrupt a lot of the cell function. And will will stress the cells, in specifically in nerve cells in the brain, and will eventually cause uh, neuronal degeneration. So you might have seen this graph previously. Uh, it shows on the x-axis you see the number of CG repeats in patients. This is all patient data. And why on the y-axis you have the onset of disease. And the onset of disease refers to the time where pre-manifest mutation carriers convert into symptomatic H2 patients. So formally, this point of time is reached when first characteristic motor signs of chorea, bradykinesia, or malcoordination become overt. And what you can see here is that there is a correlation between the CG size and the age of onset. So the longer the CG repeat size, the earlier age of onset. So uh, what you also see here is that despite the fact that HD patients might have, C, uh, might have the same CG uh, size, you see a, a lot of variation here. So you would expect that you have this, that all of the patients would follow this black line with the black dots, but instead you see a lot of spread. So if you look at statistics, the length of the CG expansion explained between 40 to 70 percent of the variability in age of onset. So thus, a current challenge is thus to assess the relative contribution of genetic factors, except from the, the distinct from the CG mutation in the Huntington uh, gene, and to identify further genes that modify disease outcome. So to illustrate this further, let's assume that you have four individuals who have the same CG repeat size. So this, these individuals will produce normal Huntington, and then they will have this expansion of CG and produce muted Huntington. So let's assume that four individuals have the exact same uh, length of this CG repeat. It is very likely that all of these four individuals will develop motor symptoms or other symptoms related to HD at different ages. So it is very common that the disease will manifest itself differently in every individual. Uh, and the characteristic symptoms can be the same, but for example, some people, some patients will have more motor symptoms, other will more have cognitive or psychiatric symptoms, as well as that some will have an early age onset than expected, 
it won't follow that line I showed you previously or later age of onset or some will uh, develop a milder progression of disease while others will show a faster progression. So very often HD will manifest itself differently in HD gene carriers despite the fact of the CG size and it could be exactly the same we will still see uh, a difference in disease manifestation. So the question is, why might this be then? So if you go back to this first initial slide, the DNA sequence of any two people is 99.9% .9 identical, more or less. However, we all differ somewhat across the genome. So we have the HD gene there. Then we have sites in the DNA sequence where individuals differ at a single DNA base pair. And these sites are called SNPs, single nucleotide polymorphisms. And I didn't indicate here, but there are actually 10 million SNPs in the genome. So we have 20,000 genes and we have 10 million SNPs in the genome. And these SNPs are really important because they actually contribute to that the individuals differ between each other. We all differ between each other. We have the same genes, but then we have these small differences that make, our, make, make, a law, make us unique. So these uh, SNPs that affect, uh, affect an individual's uh, development, growth, and function, and it also greatly affect an individual's disease risk or manifestation to disease. So if we think about HD then, SNPs might contribute to a modified disease outcome distinctly from the CG mutation in the Huntington gene. So if we go back to this uh, original chart, now we're moving into the genetic modifier effect. There are a lot of factors that can affect this variation that we see. It could be mental factors, but I have focused on genetic modifiers to try to uh, identify genetic modifiers, like these SNPs, for example, that would alter uh, age of onset in patients. Uh, so the definition of a genetic modifier is a gene or genetic variant that affects the expression of another gene. So we want to find uh, other genes or genetic variants that affect the expression of the Huntington gene. So let's stick to the modifying part here. There are currently no treatments for uh, HD. They're all symptomatic. And there's definitely there are not, no treatments that stop or reverse disease progression in HD. So what a disease modifying drug would do would actually uh, it would be designed to, to modify the course of the disease. So a disease modifying medicine is broadly meant to, to halt or to delay the neural loss therefore slow in the progression of neurologic symptoms and modify the clinical course of the disease. So we, here this chart is just showing the different stages and what I want to just illustrate for this is the genetic predictability of HD makes it potentially the most tractable uh, of the neurodegenerative diseases for early intervention. So the optimal time to, to use disease-modifying uh, disease therapies would be in uh, pre-manifest, before the patient actually develops symptoms. So, what I, so when, I, when we research on genetic modifiers, this is actually to, to, with the aim to develop disease-modifying therapies that then can delay or prevent uh, symptom onset in HD patients. So yet another concept here, uh, which is called allelic imbalance. So as I told you previously, uh, we all have two copies of each gene, one from the mo mother and one from the father. Uh, and normally, these two copies uh, are expressed at the same level. But sometimes, however, this is not the case. And that would be then an example of uh, allelic imbalance. So this is what I'm illustrating here with a teeter-totter uh, uh, showing there's a balance between the levels of the mutant Huntington, which is cytotoxic, and the normal Huntington, which is protective and beneficial and good for, for the nerve cells. 
So we can just uh, imagine then that the, the balance of the normal and mutant Huntington may be an important modulator of pathogenesis in HD. So one another concept is promoter. I had that in the title of, of this talk as well. So promoter is uh, every gene has a promoter. So it's uh, closely located to the gene. So I assume that this would be the start of the light gray hair would be the start, uh, start of Huntington gene. Uh, the Huntington gene has a promoter sequence. And then there are a bunch of different proteins that are required to bind into the promoter. So the promoter is kind of like a switch telling the gene to be expressed. Let's produce some RNA, let's produce some protein. And there are actually required quite a lot of proteins for this to happen. So the RNA polymerase will bind in and together with six, seven other protein friends, and they will sit there in a cluster. But, uh, and this is kind of like the dogma of gene regulation. But then there are also, and we're learning more and more about this, there are other proteins that will bind to the promoter and this region between genes. And we are learning more and more about which proteins these are. So the So the title of uh, the, the paper that uh, George was referring to is, and now I hope that you understand the title a little better when I kind of walked you through a little bit and gave you a little bit more background. The title is A SNP in the Huntington Promoter, Alters NFKB Binding, and this, uh, and this is a bidirectional genetic modifier of Huntington's disease. So uh, what we started off with is we actually wanted to understand what is regulating the Huntington gene. We were actually looking for two things. First, we were looking for proteins that bind to the promoter. So if you imagine here, it's um, the promoter. The Huntington is down here. And then all of this upstream is promoter. And you have proteins binding to the promoter region. So we wanted to learn more about which proteins are binding, but we also wanted to learn are there any genetic variants, are there any changes in the DNA that affect binding and affect the expression of uh, the Huntington gene. So when we started off a few years ago, many years ago now, <laughs> there were only a few known proteins to bind to the Huntington promoter, and that was SP1 and AP2. Uh, and there were a few sequences that were important, but not much more than this. So uh, our aim was to learn more. And if we could identify these factors then, they might potentially be used as therapeutic targets, disease modifier, um, disease modifying drugs to be correct in HD. So, What we first do, did was to analyze the promoter regions of the Huntington gene originated for HD patients. So this is really a, quite a messy slide. I'll try to walk you through this one. Uh, the first experiment when we looked at the promoter of HD patients was you use the DNA and then you cut out the promoter sequence uh, and glue it into specific DNA constructs. And then we're reducing DNA from HD patients. So we would cut out the HD promoters from uh, the DNA from HD patients, and we would put them into DNA constructs. And then you introduce these constructs into cells and measure how much light is emitted. The more light, the more expression of a gene. So the first panel here to the left is actually showing the result when we look at 12 different constructs. And they all originate from HD patients. And it's showing on the, the more light, the, the higher the bar, and the more expression of Huntington gene. So what we noticed when we compared these constructs and looked at how, many, uh, how much light it emitted in the, in the cells, we noticed the construct 5 was significant, significantly lower in Huntington gene expression compared to the other constructs. 
And this was very kind of, it was really significant and we repeated this multiple times. So what we wanted to do next is to, to see what, what, what is causing this reduction in, in, in Huntington gene expression in Construct 5. So we sequenced uh, the Construct 5. We actually read and read every DNA base pair in that construct and we compared it to Construct 4, for example, and that's what you see here. So if we compare Construct 4 and 5, 4 is kind of a high expression and, and, and the Construct 5 is low expression, this is due to 10 base pair differences. And these are the differences we see among us individuals as well. So this is the way it looks like. So for example, in this position, in Construct 4, it's a G in the DNA, while in Construct 5, it's a T. And in this position, it's an A, that's G in the Construct 5. So these are the small, subtle differences that we observed when we compared these two constructs. We were also curious to see, okay, which proteins bind to, to this, the, this promoter sequence, and especially which proteins bind to where we can see differences. And we got a list of, of different, a bunch of different uh, proteins that you can see there. And we did a bunch of different experiments that I really want, I, I won't spend time on, on walking through them. But uh, we show that NF kappa B, no, I don't get the pointer to work there. NF kappa B was really crucial for, for binding to the Huntington gene. It was crucial. Uh, and this change was crucial and was kind of uh, uh, resulting in this reduction of, of Huntington gene expression. So let's look at NF kappa B. NF kappa B, I won't go into details now, but is one of the most famous proteins in the cell. It really is a key regulator of transcription for a lot of, lot of, lot of different genes. So what NF kappa B does when it's in the cell is to look for sequences like this. It likes this sequence. When it sees this sequence in the DNA, which is comprised of a GGG uh, specifically, that's the sequence it likes most. And it also likes the CC in the end. And it's not so important, but it kind of likes the AATTC here. But this is a 10 base pair uh, sequence that he likes. And this first uh, uh, result that we um, noticed up here, that was due to a change in the last base pair. And that caused this 50% reduction in Huntington gene expression. So we were curious to see then, is there actually, are there any known SNPs in this sequence that nf B likes? And um, a definition of a SNP is that there has to be a 1% frequency in the human population to be called a SNP. So it can't be too rare. It actually has to be established in the human population. And luckily enough, we could find, I mean, this is just uh, other people have done. Uh, you go into databases as a researcher and you, you, you see uh, if there's a validated SNP, a documented SNP in this region. Uh, this is work done by other researchers. There was a documentation of a SNP that's called RS1310-2260. And that one is at the first base pair in, in this 10 base pair sequence that NFKB likes. And most people, most Caucasians have a G at that position, which is really good for NFKB. And then 5% have an A. And that A, nf B doesn't really like. It doesn't identify, it doesn't recognize the, the, the site uh, as good. And it doesn't bind as good. I'll show you that as well. So first of all, what we did, we noticed that there was a SNP. We wanted to see what kind of functional effect did it have. So what we did was to change, and uh, we introduced this A uh, sequence in the construct. And what we could see here, that's what this bar is showing, uh, we could see a reduction compared to having a G there. That's the reduction you see. So still, this A variant was causing a reduction in gene expression. And it was equal uh, to what you see with, um, uh, with the change at the last base pair position. 
I apologize, my pointer keeps disappearing. There we go. Um, so what we wanted to see also was, did it really affect the binding, as you would assume it did? And then there are different assays you can do. Uh, there's a binding assay that you call EMSA. So what you do is you mix the protein. So we mixed NF-kappa-B with the DNA sequence uh, that would have this stretch and a little bit extra on both sides. And if the protein binds to the DNA, you will actually have a band. So when the DNA had a G there, we could see this band. But when we switched the DNA to, and we introduced an A instead, there was no band, which means that the NF-kappa B wasn't able to bind to the DNA. So having the A variant totally abolished the, the ability for NF-kappa B to bind to the promoter. So this is all work in cells. We, we identified this genetic variant that's there, which affects the gene expression of Huntington, and it does so by uh, abolishing the ability for NF-kappa B to bind to the protein in the Huntington promoter. So this is cells. So what happens in humans? We want to take this into humans. So this is a scenario we're playing with. We have NF-kappa B, we have, in some cases, we have a SNP, uh, some cases a G, and in some HD or any patient, uh, any person, not an HD patient, has an A there. Uh, and we, from our uh, laboratory work and the work in cells, we could say that disrupted NF-kappa B binding to the, to the promoter actually reduced Huntington expression. So that's the scenario. So with this background, we actually stipulated two hypotheses. So the first hypothesis being, let's assume that you have the A variant on the mutant Huntington uh, HD allele. What would happen then? You would have less binding of NF-kappa B. It would actually not bind as well. You have less expression of the mutant Huntington and maybe delayed age of onset. That's the first hypothesis. The other hypothesis would be that if you would have the A variant on the normal allele, you would have uh, less binding of NF-kappa B and less expression of the good, protective, beneficial Huntington pro protein, and that that would lead to accelerated age of onset. So these are the two hypotheses we were playing with. So to, to be able to figure this out, we went on to genotype for this specific SNP, the uh, RS1310-2260 SNP in HD patients. So we first tested the first hypothesis. What happens if you have the A variant of the mutant HD allele? So we genotyped Danish HD families, and some of these actually had A variant on the HD disease allele. So this is kind of the graph that I showed you previously. You have the CG size uh, on the x-axis and the age of onset on the y-axis. And the blue dots and the blue, uh, sorry, the black dots and the, the black line indicate uh, the G variant carriers. While the red line and the red dots indicate the SNP A carriers, the rare SNP. And it is quite obvious that you have a shift in these lines. So what we could show was that you, uh, in average, get 10 years later age of onset in patients with the, with the ASNP. So for example, you see this uh, table here, and this is kind of the results, the statistical analysis that we did. And uh, depending on which CG size uh, you have, the SNP effect will, will vary. But let's look at, for example, the, having the, the patients with uh, the CG size of uh, 43 repeats. It's expected to have uh, an age of onset for motor symptoms at around age of 48. But this SNP, if you had the A variant, you would actually delay it by 13 years. And this varied, as I say, but in average it was a, a 10-year uh, delay in, in age of onset in the A variant carriers. So that actually confirmed our first two processes. We went on to, to uh, 
to look at the second hypothesis, which was what happens if you have the A variant on the small allele? Uh, would, would it actually lead to accelerated age of onset? So we went on to genotype community population where some subjects actually had the A variant on the normal allele. And we could see the opposite here. So it was the shift where the red line is below the black, which indicates that it's an early age of onset for the HD gene carriers with the A variant. And it was approximately four years earlier compared to, to, uh, to, to the GE variant carriers. So this is kind of like a, uh, the result from all of this, a little summary slide uh, where we show that NF-kappa-B is really important. It has its favorite little temp-based pair motif where some people, patients, have an A instead of G. If so, and depending on which allele it sits on, uh, you might have an early age of onset or a later age of onset. So this is actually uh, what, a, what is a, a disease modifier, a genetic modifier. This is kind of the definition of that. Uh, and that would be the SNP that we, we uh, identified. So let's focus on NF-kappa-B then. Uh, we wanted to see, could you actually modify the NF-kappa-B NF actions and would that have an effect on Huntington gene expression? So what we did, we targeted NF-kappa-B to see if we could modulate Huntington gene expression. So we, we use a, f a few different approaches and I'm going to show you uh, two or three of them. And in the left panel here, we used uh, an approach called silencing of NF-kappa B. So what you actually do there, I'm going to go back to this first slide. Uh, I'm waiting for the pointer to show up. So when you silence NF-kappa B, we totally, what you do is abolish the NF-kappa B. So this one will disappear. And when we did that, we actually could affect the uh, Huntington gene expression. It was significantly lower. It doesn't disappear. The gene is still expressing uh, because it has kind of a basic uh, expression with all these other factors, RNA, polymerase 2, et cetera, et cetera. But it does, uh, if you take, off, uh, take out NF-kappa B, it actually will reduce the Huntington gene expression. We also tried to stimulate Huntington gene expression using TNF alpha. And the TNF alpha is a, is a typical cytokine. And I'm going to go back to uh, again. So, TNF alpha, we introduced TNF alpha to the cells, and that would be these blue, blue dots, blue molecules. And when you add TNF alpha, you actually trigger NF kappa B to enter uh, the nucleus and sit on the, uh, sit on the DNA and activate the gene. And we could actually confirm that this was the case. So when we add a TNF alpha, you actually get an increased Huntington gene expression. So it, will, it worked to stimulate the Huntington gene expression. We also tried to inhibit this effect of TNF alpha and the effect of NF kappa B activity. So what we did was to add CAPE, which is an anti inflammatory uh, compound which actually acts by uh, inhibiting NF-kappa B shuttling into the nucleus, and it also inhibits NF-kappa B to bind it to DNA. So when we added a CAPE, we still had TNF-alpha, but when we added CAPE in increasing doses, we managed to inhibit the NF-kappa B action on the Huntington gene. So this is really uh, interesting and uh, it, it is kind of uh, important to, to look at this kind of modulatory effects of Huntington gene expression as well through the NF-kappa B pathways. So uh, I'm almost uh, uh, getting close to the end here. Uh, I want to just sum up again what we can talk about and how we come back to the allelic imbalance in HD where you can have all these different scenarios. So 
you could have, uh, I wouldn't say uh, allelic balance instead, where you would have an equal amount uh, expression of the, the normal and the mutant Huntington, where the teeter-totter would be uh, in balance. And these patients most likely would then almost be very close to develop signs uh, at the age when it's expected. But then in our case, for example, we identified a genetic variant, a SNP, that could sit on the wild type allele, the normal allele, which would then alter the NF kappa B and would lead to less expression of the normal Huntington. So this would lead to dominance of the mutant Huntington in, in the cells and you would lose the effects of the protective effects of normal Huntington. This resulted in earlier age of onset in HD patients. While in opposite, we also uh, show that when you have the gene variant sitting on the HD gene allele, that would affect the nf -B binding, and you would have less of the mutant toxic and the, and the uh, well, bad protein in the system. So, and then the dust effects come from the normal Huntington, and that will lead to later age of onset. So, I want to just uh, show, uh, sum up the concluding, some concluding uh, with some concluding remarks. Uh, this is actually the first clinical evidence in humans that Huntington gene silencing therapies will be efficacious. And furthermore, our findings suggest that silencing therapies should be focused on allele-specific approaches. Uh, and as you know, there are ongoing trials and a lot of effort to, to, uh, efforts focused on silencing therapies. And we are showing here that it, it will very likely be beneficial for the patient and, and hopefully with positive outcomes based on our work. Uh, we also show that it is important to keep on identifying genetic modifiers that regulate Huntington expression. It really does provide us with insights into effects on disease expressivity. I was telling you before, um, uh, the disease manifests is very different. Uh, some patients have motor, uh, motor symptoms, others have cognitive or psychiatric effects, and we have a lot of, a lot of things to learn in that area. Why do we differ in the, the manifestation, despite that the CG repeat size could be the same? And any transcription factor and regulatory pathway that alter Huntington gene expression are valid new targets for disease-modifying interventions in, the, in HD. So that's the, really the goal for, for all of this research, to develop disease-modifying therapies. Uh, genotyping of this particular SNP may also provide prognostic information for a subset, 5% of the Huntington gene carriers. And we also uh, propose further the investigation of NF-kappa B as a potential therapeutic target in HD. And, sorry, with that, I want to thank you for your attention, and I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you. Thanks, Christina. That was fantastic. Um, we have a number of questions that have come in. Uh, just to remind everybody, if you do have a question, type it in now, and we'll try to get it get to it uh, in the next few minutes. Um, one question, it's uh, clearly coming from someone who's seen a, 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 another presentation recently uh, uh, that's, or a paper that's been presented uh, and published on the identification of uh, loci or regions within the genome that may also alter um, age of onset. Um, this is the work uh, out of Mass General, John Ming Lee and Marcy McDonald, Jim Gazella's group. There, the question is: Can you compare and contrast your work with that with being done with with at Mass General? What what what's different between your approach, how you identified this SNP? versus how they have identified their, their SNPs. Mm, yeah. So they're doing a genome-wide approach where, so as I told you before, uh, we have 10 million SNPs. 
And what researchers have found out is that you don't necessarily have to look at all of these SNPs. They usually lay in blocks. So if you would uh, look at one specific SNP at one position, you can kind of expect what the other SNPs will look like. So that's, I mean, that's kind of a, uh, it saves you a lot of time, but it's also very unspecific. So what this group in particular has done then, so they will have tag, tagging SNPs. So they will have these SNPs that indicate that this region um, is, is relevant for Avanza, for example. They won't pinpoint the exact SNP. So they have to narrow that down and, and and do other types of research to be able to, to pinpoint uh, the exact SNP. So the approach they use is to save time. They kind of focus down to a region, EQTL, that's kind of a, you know, you, it's a defined region, but it's not a defined SNP. It's not a defined position. So their approach, it will guide you to a region, but then you will have maybe hundreds of SNPs that could be of interest. So they really need to, to kind of dig in and use different approaches to tease out which SNP is actually causing the changes in age of onset, for example. Did that answer your question? Well, while uh, in my work, we were actually lucky enough uh, to, um, to pinpoint this exactly one single SNP that has an effect, and it, it affects uh, in a way such as that nf kappa B, a specific protein can bind. So we are actually down to a specific change in the DNA that, that you know, causes the, the disease modifier effects we see. Thanks, Christina. Um, another, it's a nice segue, nf kappa beta, to uh, a segue to the next question is, what's your next step to make this, the research you presented today, um, to a, a drug therapy. So uh, this is this study is really I think it's it's interesting for a lot of different uh, researchers in a lot of different fields and uh, I mean the first uh, kind of take home message is really we're talking about the levels of the the wild type and the mutant and that's all about what the silencing therapies are. So we, it's really showing, my result is showing, we want to get rid of the mutant Huntington. I mean, that that's not known, but we're really, that hasn't been unknown previously, sorry. But we're really showing that it will be a valid approach and will, uh, very likely, it will work. If we continue this silencing, lowering approaches, uh, it will likely, very likely work. So that's kind of one of the, the messages. But then it's really, you can continue this research forever and ever. Um, you can just imagine how all of these different uh, changes and differences in the DNA can have different effects, such as why do some patients have um, cognitive effects and others don't, and others have psychiatric and others don't. Uh, why do some patients progress very fastly compared to others that have a milder progression? So you can just imagine that genetic modifiers affect all of these attributes, all these different attributes you can see. Not only, you can look at age of onset, that's very interesting, but you can also imagine that there all of these genetic variants, um, Sorry, genetic variants can affect all of these different attributes that you see in HD. Uh, so, but first of all, it is really kind of the lowering approaches that are very, it's kind of confirmed. This is like doing a human trial. We show that lowering constant protein will be beneficial. And then, of course, it is very interesting uh, with nf kappa B and, and uh, the nf kappa B actions. Um, so, you mentioned, Christina, that the frequency of this SNP, um, I guess at least in the Danish population, was about 5%. And then you analyzed some human samples from Canada. Did you see that the frequency in Canada, among HD patients in Canada, was the same? 
So, so it's actually a little bit uh, the other way around. So, in, in normal Caucasians, what you see most common is that you have this A variant on the, on the normal allele. And that's just evolutionary. We don't know exactly. That's just evolution or how, how the uh, variant is, is located. So, and that is in 5% Caucasians have this A variant. 95% had the G. The Danish situation was a little bit different. So it was very, um, um, a lot of families and uh, several uh, participants, like several family members in each pedigree. And uh, that was very unusual that they actually had the agent on the mutant allele. And that's also, you have un one person, one founder back in uh, we lost you, Christina. Several generations back, back. who, who, uh, Christina. Christina, can we hear you? We've lost you on our end. Uh, try one, we'll give her one more second. Christina, if you can hear us, we've, we've kind of lost audio contact with you. All right. Well, I apologize, uh, everyone, for that little audio uh, snafu, but um, that sometimes happens when we're uh, talking to folks all the way over in Sweden. So um, anyway, I, I appreciate everyone uh, joining us today. I apologize if we didn't get to all of your questions. Um, so I'm back here now if you want to continue. I find <laughs> You're back. Yeah, right. I'm back. <laughs> we were just getting rid of you. No, um, good. I'm glad you're back. Um, so, so, so did you get a little bit of my response there? That the... Um, the, um, about the SNP being in Caucasians, it's 5% having it on the, um, and in HD patients, it's on the wild type allele. That's where you see it most commonly. And then the Danish situation was a little bit unique. Uh, and that's kind of on a founder effect. Uh, one person back a few generations back who had the A variant on the mutant HD allele, but that's unusual. And uh, that, uh, you know, uh, kind of was the founder for, for and spreading this A variant on the mutant allele. But most often it is the A variant being on the normal allele and it's observed in 5% of the Caucasians. Great. Um, and another question uh, it relates to, you know, it, we have great excitement with the HD community about the current ASO study with ISIS and uh, I'm sure there will be more hunting and lowering studies soon. Um, we'll, how do you see this interesting result um, showing that you know this SNP impacts hunting and expression impacting or playing a role or we're getting incorporated to a hunting and lowering clinical studies? Is this something that uh, we should be taking into consideration when we're looking at um, you know, who should be included and excluded from a particular hunting and lowering trial? No, so the, I guess the take home message a little bit from this, uh, and this has been vividly discussed in the research community, uh, what my result is showing is that it would be beneficial to, to have allele specific approaches. The SNP doesn't really matter that much in the lowering, uh, silence, the silencing uh, therapy approaches. Uh, what is more interesting is the question if it should be allele specific silencing uh, where you only lower the levels of the mutant or uh, if you should silence both and the effects of that. So that's where the interesting discussion is. And from this I would, uh, my work suggests that you should be uh, focusing on allele specific silencing therapies. Great, thanks, Christina. Um, is this something 
you know, I'm so intrigued by the fact that it's particularly in that range of the data that you showed for folks that were, that had the Huntington disease mutation that were between 41 and 45 years of age, or sorry, um, I think that was between 41 and 45 CAGs, repeats, um, they had a really staggering delayed onset, 10 to 17, a range of 10 to 17 years. Is this something that you would foresee? Like patients can't go out and ask to be screened for this SNP right now, right? No, exactly. So uh, would be something that they could ask for to kind of get a better idea of their prognosis moving forward. Yeah. So I mean, that's where I think I think that's in the future. Hopefully, we can do that. And the more we know about these gen genetic variants, I think that that's something that we could be looking into in the healthcare system. I mean, as, as much as you would look at, you know, increased risk for diabetes or uh, any other complex disease, this would be kind of similar, but it's not offered today. And, um, but I think one day it might be offered. I mean, we're talking about looking at SNPs that might increase, again, the risk for diabetes with 5%. Here, in, in contrast, we have the SNP in 5% of the HD uh, pop population. So I think you can argue for it, but it's it's really nothing we can do at the moment, but the more we learn about these SNPs, I think that it could be potentially offered to patients uh, with, you know, testing a panel of SNPs that we know have an effect on um, disease outcome. When we have a few of these, I think it could be highly likely that we can offer that to patients. Uh, but currently, um, uh, we can't really. Okay. And finally, I, there's just one last question here. Is, is you know, will your approach be helpful for people with uh, people after onset? And I, I mean, I would guess I would tee that up and, and kind of answer, and you can chime in, Christina, saying that. Yeah, I would say that. You know, absolutely. Maybe not necessarily this snip. It's it's more you, you're looking at work defining uh, what would delay or accelerate the onset, but similarly, as Christina alluded to, there are, um, I, don't, I forget the number, is it a million or, or, you know, there are a lot of SNPs in our human genome and many of them may be, uh, a similar approach could be used to identify SNPs that um, could alter the course of people once they do uh, exhibit onset of symptoms. So there are people that have symptoms for 30 years and see people who have symptoms for five years. I, I would imagine a similar story would play out that there are genetic modifiers out there that are um, have yet to be determined, um, but no doubt are probably out there that are playing a role. So that hopefully answers that, that question. Um, so th there are no other questions. So I just want to, and we're, we're approaching the, the one o'clock hour here on the East Coast. I just want to thank Christine again. Uh, for taking the time, it's it's late late in the evening or late early evening over in Sweden. So I really appreciate it, Christine, and taking the time to make this great presentation and uh, time of your your evening to speak to the HD community on your exciting research. So thank you so much, and uh, I look forward to seeing you all or uh, speaking with you all at the next research webinar uh, coming up soon. Take care. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye.